Well, God bless you. It's so good to be here. I just suddenly realized I don't see a clock anywhere. Where is the clock? Where is the clock? Hallelujah. Well, you know what? It's wonderful. It's Sunday morning. We're in Elkton, Virginia. Can't think of a better place on planet Earth to be today than to be right here with you. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, God, I thank you. You have set time aside to be with us. I thank you that we can call you Father and that you call us your children. And we thank you, we bless you, and we honor you because you sent us Jesus, your only son. And Lord Jesus, we're so grateful that you came. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful that you died to save us. We're so grateful that you rose from the dead and that you have delivered us from the law of sin and death. There is no one like you. We bless your holy name. Holy Spirit, we need you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear what has been planned by the Father, what's ordained by Jesus Christ, our Savior. Help us, Holy Spirit, to receive everything that's been ordained in heaven for us today. We say that everything will be said and done to give praise and honor and glory to Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Healer, the Head of the Church, and our soon returning King. And everybody in agreement said, Amen and Amen. God bless you. Um, I want to share with you something that um, was, it was kind of an unusual thing that happened to me. Um, I went to a Bible study back in, in January. Someone that I had known for a long time said, I want you to come to my house and do a Bible study and pray for the sick. And I said, okay, we can do that. And she said, and I'm going to ask all of my friends, all of my old friends that are Baptist and, um, and Methodist to come. And I said, okay, that sounds good too. And so uh, I knew that they were old friends because she's been filled with the Holy Spirit for a pretty good while. So I thought, well, these are friends she's had for a long time. And so, um, of course, I prepared something that I thought was the right thing to have prepared for a group of people when half of them are spirit-filled and believe that God wants to help us <laughs> and the other half that aren't, and they don't know what God does or doesn't want to do let's just be blunt because I grew up in a Methodist church and I was taught his ways are mysterious you don't know what God's going to do so here I am I have a split group and um and when I started talking what I'm going to share with you today is what spontaneously came out of my mouth nothing that I had prepared for was what I began to talk about and what I began to share with everybody was about the great eternal value that every person has because we all have value most of us just don't realize that it's an eternal value and most of us don't think about a value that's been given to us by God our Father you know when you read the Gospels Matthew Mark Luke and John you see how Jesus freely healed everyone well, Jesus was proving the will of God, the love of God, the ways of God. And so Jesus didn't turn anybody down. I mean, I've argued with some good denominational people. Jesus really does want to heal this person. I can prove it to you. And they go, what is the proof? I said, Jesus never told anybody. You need to be sick a little longer, come back later. Jesus never, ever said that to anyone. Jesus never said it to anyone. God, the Father's trying to teach you something. You haven't suffered enough. Jesus never, ever said that. I can prove to you that Jesus wants to heal you today. He wants to help you today. He wants to bless you today because Jesus never told anybody, come back later. And so in Luke chapter 20, there's this verse in Luke 20 where it says, uh, they came to him and they said, teacher, we know, and we, uh, we know that you say and teach rightly and you do not show personal favoritism. 
Now that phrase about personal favoritism popped up in my head. God doesn't have any favorites. Jesus doesn't show personal favoritism. As a matter of fact, that's what they were going to use to um, praise him before they condemned him. He said, so Jesus, we know that you teach rightly and you don't show any favoritism. Now, Jesus not showing favoritism distinguished him from everybody else because favoritism was highly practiced in the church. It was highly practiced in the church. And Jesus was significantly different from everyone else in the synagogue, all the scribes, all the Pharisees, all of the elders, because he didn't show favoritism to anyone. In other words, he treated everybody the same. But to say that Jesus treated everybody the same is to just water it down to nothing. Because it's not that Jesus just treats everybody the same. It's just that Jesus honors the eternal value that God has placed on every living soul that walks on planet Earth. Jesus knows the value of your soul because God gave that value before you took your first breath. We all have an eternal value that comes from God the Father. It's pre-established. It's pre-ordained. You know, you could ask, well, why would God do that? We are the only thing that's made in his image. Nothing else is made in the image of God except for man. We are the ones that are made in his image. We were created for a specific purpose, a godly purpose in this earth. And because of that, God pre-established, he pre-ordained a value that is eternal. It's unending. And you have that value. And Jesus Christ understands it. Your eternal value is not based on your accomplishments. It's not based on your achievements. It's established before your first heartbeat. Your eternal value has nothing to do with your success or your failure. Your eternal value has nothing to do with what you do for other people or listen to me, this is really important, or what other people do against you. Your eternal value cannot be diminished by how much good you do versus how much bad you do, how much right you do versus how much wrong you do. Your eternal value can never be altered by anything because your eternal value is established in heaven by God the Father and nobody can touch it. Nobody can change it. Nobody can reduce it. Nobody can increase it. You can't change it. I can't change it. Your eternal value is established by God the Father in heaven. Somebody say hallelujah. God gave us an eternal value. It's consistent, it's constant, and it doesn't have an end. It has nothing to do with your education, has nothing to do with your career. <laughs> when I go to other countries, I can say this really well. It has nothing to do with your color, it has nothing to do with your language. It has nothing to do with whether you're slave or free. And there are more slaves on planet Earth than we even think about anymore. Bill mentioned that we were in Mexico. They understand the slave-free thing real quick because when, when, when the cartels pick you out, you're a slave of a drug cartel. You don't have any freedom. Good Lord above, you just wouldn't believe. Do we need a wall? We've needed a, long, a wall so long ago, it ain't funny. We're just over the border a small ways. 
He had the assignment to go speak to the men's group, and then that men's group was a 12-year-old boy. Cartel started using him when he was 9, 10, 11, 12. By the time he was 12, he'd had enough. He didn't want to do anymore. And you know what they do to you when you don't, when you don't do what they say? But this little boy was driven right up in front of the church where we were ministering, thrown out on the church steps and was told, you ever leave here, you're dead. That's what's right on the border of our country. On the border. Let me come back to saying this. You have an eternal value assigned to you by God the Father in heaven. Period. You cannot increase it. You cannot decrease it. You can't add to it. You can't take away from it. Thank God the mistakes that we make in this life do not diminish our eternal value. Thank God what other people do to us does not diminish our eternal value. Thank God what God says, what God established is going to stand the test of time. And it doesn't matter who does what, what happens, what's said. Your eternal value can never, ever change. Mm. You know what evolution tells you? Evolution tells you're the product of a process. You know what evolution does? It reduce, reduces your value to dirt. That's all you're worth. How many people wake up and realize today that there's, there's a new mentality? You're not worth anything. Oh, my. Evolution reduces your worth to dirt. What a contrast to God Almighty. What a contrast to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that says that you have a worth. And it was so great, Jesus Christ came to the earth to die to save it. Bless the Lord who lives forever. Good God. So one of the things that I began to say was, gee, how can we possibly understand what our worth is? How can you measure it if it's eternal, if it doesn't have any end to it? Because we are eternal beings. We have earthly bodies that die, but you're going to live forever. In heaven or in hell, you have eternal worth. You have eternal value. You are an eternal being in a physical body. The body will cease, but you're going to continue. So if we have eternal, if we have eternal value, how can we possibly understand it? If we have eternal value, how can you measure it? We can measure light. We can measure sound. Goodness, it seems like we can measure virtually everything. The only way I know to begin to measure your eternal value, my eternal value, our eternal value, is to look at Jesus. That's the only way I know how to do it. Because your value, my value, was worth Jesus Christ going to the cross, being tortured to death, to pay the price for sin, because you and I can never pay it. You can't pay for your sin, not according to God's rules, you can't. You can't pay for your sin in this life, and you can't live in hell long enough to pay for it either. There's no such thing as going to hell for a thousand years, you've paid the price, you're out. That is not in the Bible. You can't ever pay the price. But your value is so great, so what did God do? He sent the priceless gift of Jesus Christ who did the one thing that we can't do, which is pay the price for our sin with his own holy blood so that our value, our eternal value assigned by God could be secured and taken to heaven to be with the Father forever. If you want to know what you're worth, look at Jesus. Because Jesus is the one who died to save you. Is somebody worth helping? Look at Jesus. Jesus died to save their soul. Is somebody worth going the extra mile for? Look at Jesus. Did Jesus go the extra mile for me? Yes. Did he go the extra mile for you? Yes. Did he go the extra mile for them? Yes. This is how you begin to understand eternal value. Why is this important? Because... 
You need to see yourself the way God sees you. If he sees you as valuable, you're valuable. What are we going to argue about for crying out loud? I've never seen it fam and I've never seen it fail. You get into a family circle, you get to know the family a little bit. <laughs> there's always a favorite. In a family, there's always. It's just it's human nature. It's not commendable. It's not it's not commendable, but it is human nature. And you want to make grandma's eyes, eyes light up, mention the family favorite. You're God's favorite. You're his favorite. There's nothing God wouldn't do to help you. The proof is Christ going to the cross, going into the grave, <laughs> and coming out victorious. Your eternal value. Your eternal value is so big, Jesus went through hell itself to secure you, to make you the property of the Father. You're the blood-bought, blood-washed child of God. The Bible is altogether different when you understand eternal value of every living soul. And your faith changes too. It's easy for the favorite in the family to believe they're going to get the best seat at the table. It's easy for the favorite in the family to believe that they're going to get the preference for this and the preference for that. They're going to get the biggest plate of food. They're going to get the best slice of cake. It's easy for the favorite, but the one that's the least favorite in the family doesn't believe anything good is going to come. And how many times did the church feel that way about itself? But you're the favorite. You have a value so great that Jesus Christ went to the cross to make you the blood-bought, the blood-washed child of God. Does Jesus want to help you? Yes. Does God want to help you? Yes. Does the Holy Spirit want to help you? Yes. I want to show you something else about your eternal value. There's something in the book of Revelation called the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now the church, all of us together, are very often called the bride of Christ. And Jesus is waiting for this great event when all of the saints on earth come and sit down with him and we, the church, man and woman alike, are called the bride of Christ. It's a really big event. As a matter of fact, the book of Revelation kind of makes a big deal out of it. Now, there's something I want to point out to you because it will help you understand your eternal value. Angels don't sit down at the table. You and I do. Gabriel is not going to sit at the table. Michael the archangel is not going to sit at the table. The marriage supper at the lamb, the uh, of the lamb, the only ones sitting at the table are going to be you and me. You've got to get a grip on your eternal value. Because it changes your faith. It changes your understanding. All of a sudden you realize, well, God does want to bless me. Of course he does. Before you were born, you were destined to live with an, with an eternal value that comes from God the Father. And at the end of everything, you're destined to sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb and angels are going to come and serve you. From beginning to end. Your eternal value is predetermined, pre-established, pre-ordained by God the Father. And it's bigger than you think. It's bigger than you live. It's bigger than what you are. There's more to you than the eyes can see. 
but Jesus can see it and the Holy Spirit can see it and Jesus will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. What an incredible statement. Of course he won't leave us. Of course he won't forsake us. We have eternal value determined by God the Father and Jesus is going to honor that value with everything that is in him. The Holy Spirit knows your eternal value and the Holy Spirit is going to honor the value that God gave you with everything that is in him which is why the Holy Spirit will come. He will manifest. He will be here. He will help us. He's got nothing else to do but to preserve and to protect the eternal value of the church. Somebody say hallelujah. Oh God almighty. You have an eternal value. When you're young, you hope that your value increases. <laughs> right? <laughs> you hope. Then you get a little older and you figure, well, this is all that I am. And then you get a little older than that. And then you begin to realize or you begin to think, I'm losing my value. I said at the beginning, and I said it as most accurately as I could, your value never changes. Things happen to people in life. Things happen to us because of what other people say and do. Sometimes things happen to us because of the decisions that we've made. And when people say and do things that are wrong to us, against us, it can leave a mark. It can leave a mark that sometimes people can see and sometimes it leaves a mark only you know about. When Jesus Christ went to the cross, he was marked and he was scarred. He was taking your marks, and he was taking my marks. You were never meant to carry the marks of this world on you. Jesus Christ went to the cross carrying your marks and my marks. Listen, guilt, shame, rejection. He carried your marks. He carried my marks. There are not to be any marks on you anymore. You are the blood bought, the blood washed church of the Lord Jesus Christ and you have an eternal value that cannot be diminished it cannot be altered by what anybody has said or done to put a mark on you I think of it this way by the blood of the lamb we are markless <laughs> by the blood of the lamb we are remarkable You have an eternal value. I have an eternal value. We have an eternal value. I want to go to Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to read a couple of verses there. Bless God. I have eternal value. You have eternal value. We have eternal value. We have a value that's far greater, above and beyond anything that we could imagine or think. Ephesians chapter 1. Hallelujah. When we go to the prison, we say this. If you have it, say amen. If you have Ephesians 1, say amen. Okay. Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to drop down to verse number 4. We read verses 4, 5, and 6. Yeah. Just as he, God the Father, chose us in him, God the Son, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons and daughters, by Jesus Christ to himself, God the Father, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, 
by which he made us accepted in the beloved. God has chosen us. We had nothing to do with it. It was before the foundation. It was from the beginning of time. It was when God had the idea that you and I should walk on planet Earth. That was when God gave us an eternal value and that we would stand before him blameless, markless, free and independent of how we measure ourselves. Stand before him in love, having predestined us to be his children. And that's the good pleasure of his will. How do you understand your eternal value? Look at Ephesians. He preordained it. He preestablished it. And it is his will. It's God's will that you, as an eternal being, you, with an eternal value assigned to you before your first breath, that you would be his child and that you would live and rule and reign forever and ever and ever in heaven with Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You have an eternal value that is priceless. It cannot be measured. The only way that you can, be, you can begin to understand your value is to understand the horrible price that Jesus paid and to understand that while you may have begun, begun here, your destiny is the marriage supper of the Lamb with Jesus Christ. It's your destiny. There are things that God wants to do for you. The idea that God wants to bless us is so generalized, it's hard to make it specific for just yourself. But your value is very, very specific. You can't add to it. You can't take away from it. Nothing you do can change the value that God gave to you before you were born. Jesus Christ spent his entire ministry proving to people they had value and worth in the eyes of God. They didn't get that from church. They didn't get that from the scribes and the Pharisees. They didn't get that from the hypocrites. <laughs> they didn't get that from the religious leaders. They didn't get that from anybody but Jesus. I'm going to ask everybody to stand to their feet. Life on planet Earth is not easy for anybody anywhere. I don't care who you are. The devil is an equal opportunity tormentor. <laughs> He's so full of hatred and evil, he can't cease to stop spreading it. The spirit of hatred and evil is mind-boggling. Even when you think you begin, you think you really know something else happens that just takes it, takes evil and hatred to a whole new level. And yet, at the same time, I'm standing here telling you today that God the Father loves you. God the Son loves you. God the Holy Spirit loves you. And the marks of this world don't belong on you. They don't belong on you. The marks of this world don't belong on your body. They don't belong on your soul. They don't belong on your spirit. They don't belong on your family. They don't belong on your home. They don't belong on your career. They don't belong on anything that pertains to you. The only thing that belongs on you is the grace, the love, 
the protection, the provision, the healing, the deliverance, the peace, and the joy of God Almighty. And that's what we're supposed to walk in. And nothing less. <laughs> nothing, <laughs> nothing less. We're not supposed to walk in anything less. I hope that in these la last few minutes, you've begun to think of yourself a little differently. I hope you've begun to think of yourself a little more highly. I hope that you've begun to think of yourself a little more soberly. Because there's something that God wants to do for you today. And there's something that Jesus wants to provide for you today. And there's something that the Holy Spirit wants to make sure is delivered to you today. Bless God. Bless God. So we're just going to make it really simple. There are things that you might need in your body, something physical. Might be pain, might not be pain, just might be a condition that doesn't have pain, but it makes life hard, and it's making things worse. There might be something else that has nothing to do with your body something else to do with family, something else to do with position, something that has to do with relationships, something that has to do with provision. I'm talking about lack and want. Today is your day. You're in the right place at the right time, worshiping the right God, calling on the right name of Jesus Christ.